Hi everyone. Welcome to this webinar presented by the Independent Living Centre of WA. The Independent Living Centre for WA is a not-for-profit organisation and we provide a range of services to enable West Australians of all ages and abilities to live more independent and fulfilling lives. We have a range of services and teams at the Independent Living Centre, including our assistive equipment service, Noah's Ark Toy Library, the ILC Tech Team, which is my team, ILC Hire, OT Driver Assessment, as well as a number of programs related to grants, equipment, respite and community care. So welcome to this webinar today entitled Knowing Me, Communication Tools to Prepare for Transition. My name's Kelly Moore and as I mentioned I'm from the ILC Tech team and I'm a speech pathologist. The purpose of this slide is to really show that just with a few pictures you can get to know a lot about a person. So you can see a photo of me, the logo for where I work and some of my hobbies and things that I enjoy. And this really sets the scene for today's workshop in which we'll be discussing a number of visual communication tools to be able to assist people to get to know others. Hence the title, Knowing Me. I'd like to share with you first a quote from a parent. As a parent of a son with a disability, I worry about what will happen to him when I'm no longer around. When involved in some futures planning with my local area coordinator, I explain that my biggest worry is other people don't understand what Adam is saying, as his speech is very difficult to understand. What would happen if he was sick and couldn't tell anyone? How could he tell someone about his likes? What he wanted to do? How would he have a say when I was no longer around to translate for him? So I was able to work with Adam and his mum to be able to offer some suggestions for simple communication tools that might be able to assist Adam. So we developed a communication passport for him. The passport provides information about Adam, such as people in his life, family and friends, how he communicates, things Adam likes to talk about, hobbies, his past, special moments and events in Adam's life. Things that cheer him up, things that upset him, things he needs help with, health and lots of other information. Adam now has visuals to show people and once he shows others the passport it's amazing how they can now follow what he is saying. The passport is helping him to become a more independent communicator. Adam's mum says, no words can express how grateful I am to you for giving me some peace of mind knowing Adam will have a voice when I'm no longer around to translate for him. So with just a simple tool, Adam was able to use it to get to know other people, new communication partners and not rely on his mum to translate for him. Adam also recently used his passport uh, when going into a new respite arrangement and was able to use it to get to know the carers and other people at respite with, with good success. So this really sets the scene for the topic of today's presentation, which is around communication and preparing for transitions. So some common transitions that we thought of were starting school, perhaps leaving school, and that could be leaving primary school to go to high school or leaving high school altogether, changing or moving schools. Uh, another transition could be starting work or moving into post-school options. Even meeting a new teacher, getting a new education assistant or support worker or carer, a new therapist or doctor or even going into hospital, there's a range of new communication partners that might need to know a little bit about you to be able to chat with you and to be able to support you. It might be that you start a new hobby, for example, going to scouts or starting horse riding where the people there might want to know a little bit about you. Or perhaps when you're even just meeting new friends or new neighbours or people in the community. We know that during periods of transition that there's a real growth in an individual's social networks. So initially, say for a young child, they're mainly interacting with family and maybe some close friends. But from there, social networks might grow, for example, when they start school, there'll be 30 new kids in the class, there'll be a new teacher, a new principal, a new education assistant, quite a range of people that might need to know a little bit about 
the individual to be able to really communicate well with them. So we need to consider all of these different individuals in someone's growing social network. There's a fantastic tool called the Social Networks Tool by Sarah Blackstone and Huntberg, which can be used to be able to really plan out an individual's social networks and which communication tools might be appropriate. So you might want to check that tool out. So this presentation will share with you a range of simple communication tools that are easy to make and easy to use that allow communication partners um, to share and to get to know the person with a disability or with complex communication needs. These tools that I'll talk about today really provide a context for allowing for more successful communication and interaction. As often we find, once we're on the same page or have the same, have a bit of a knowledge of the context of the discussion, we're able to have much more successful interactions. These tools support inclusion, participation, can build people's independence, and can also help to build new relationships in these periods of transition. So the first tool that I want to explore in quite a bit of detail is what's known as personal communication passports. This is their website, www.communicationpassports.org.uk. Personal communication passports are person-centred booklets for those who cannot easily speak for themselves. They're a great way of making sense of that formal, lengthy assessment information and recording important things about a person in a really easy to use format. Sally Miller invented personal communication passports approach in 1991, coinciding with a similar approach known as client books. At the time, passports were a new way of documenting and presenting information about children and adults with disabilities who were unable to speak for themselves. They have since become really widely used in home, care and social settings, as well as health and education settings and employment. Personal communication passports are a really great way of making sense of all of that information that we know about someone and supporting individuals to transition between services. It's really important to note that the passport is more of the end product. Creating the passport is a process. The decision to create and use a passport gives a really good focus for ongoing home and school liaison and a partnership between families and other individuals that are working with the person that has the passport. So what else can I tell you about passports? So they're practical and person-centred. They allow us to pull together lots of different information from lots of different people. So there might be information that's contributed by teachers or the physio or the doctors, as well as most important people from the family. They're really informative, useful and fun documents. They're highly personal. There are a range of different guidelines and resources to help us create passports, which is great. And I will go out to the um, Personal Communication Passports website in a moment to really help you navigate around there and find all the information that you need. You'll see on the screen is um, a guidelines for good practice booklet that's available from the call centre. And I highly recommend that if you're thinking about creating a passport for an individual, that you um, get a hold of that guide because it really does give you a really good structure to be able to create a passport. The other great thing about passports is they don't require really any expensive technology. They can be made in a very low tech way. Um, lots of people use PowerPoint, which many have available on their computers to be able to create these resources. So who uses passports? So in my line of work, they can be used with children, young people, adults, really anybody who just loves to have a chat, has a lot to say, but has difficulty in doing so. So they're often used by people with disabilities, in particular people with complex communication needs who maybe aren't able to share that information, but want to be able to introduce themselves and really um, get to know other people and they can use the passport as a way of doing so. They're used in a range of settings, like I mentioned, home, school, work, in the community, really anywhere where you might come across someone that you need to get to know. The idea of the passports is that they present the person positively as an individual and not a set of problems or disabilities. They provide a place for the person's own views and preferences to be recorded and drawn to the attention of others. They reflect a person's unique character and sense of humour, and some of the examples that I have coming up will be able to demonstrate this. 
They should describe a person's most effective means of communication and how others can best communicate with and support the person. So for example, if the person's using some keyword signing, there might be photos of the different signs that the person uses and what they mean. Or descriptions about particular sounds or facial expressions that the person makes and what they mean to be able to help new communication partners really understand how that person gets their message across. Passports draw together information from the past and the present and from different contexts and settings to help staff and conversation partners really understand the person and have successful interactions. Most importantly, passports place an equal value on the views of all, those, all, all the people that know the person well, as well as the views of, of different professionals. Passports are written in a really accessible way and they don't assume that the reader knows anything about the person. So they can really be used or even read before somebody meets that individual to really get to know them and how best to interact with them. They're simple, clear and honest and direct in the information that they provide. They should be good looking, really attractive little booklets that someone would be really wanting to carry around and proud to get out and share with somebody. It's important that the passports don't have a lot of jargon in them. They should include simple, straightforward language and often jokes and little comments are included to really make them more personalised. The mood of the text in the passport should be positive and upbeat and humour is a really lovely way of getting a message across. So what I'll do now is I'm just going to head out to the passport website and under this link here for creating passports what you can do is head in and check out some of the templates which is just a nice way of getting a feel for what a passport is. Again, it's important to note that passports should be really personalised and these templates are really just a guide to help you get started. So let me share for you an example of a template. So the templates start out with some general instructions, which is really important for you to read, and then some copyright information as they had been developed by the call centre in Scotland. So this is the cover page, this is a book about me where a picture can be inserted of the person and some little instruction, please read, this book will help you get to know me and how I communicate. Often then there's an index or a contents page which includes the titles of the following pages to really direct the person to the most, um, direct the person quickly to the information that they need. You might have a general page that includes information about the person important things that you need to know about the person. For example, I uh, recently met a client who was really scared of going on an escalator and so that would be really important for that support worker that was taking that person out into the community to know that straight away. I have another client that's frightened of clowns so I would put this on that page so that that person would know that straight up that they're really frightened of clowns and not to put them in that situation. You can have some information about the person's family and again you can include text and pictures, special people or special things, things they like to talk about. I really like to put information in about things people like to talk about because it gives uh, the communication partner a topic to raise that the person would be interested in hearing about. Some information about how the person communicates can be listed. It might include information about their communication device or their communication book that provides direction to their new communication partner about how to use those aids. This is another way of presenting information about how I communicate, things you should do to help me communicate, like give me plenty of time, and please don't ask me more than one question at a time. You can include information about fun things that the person likes, places they like going to, things that upset them or make them angry, things that they might be working on, things that they need help with, about eating and drinking, or information about their vision. Often you might also have a page about other equipment that the person might have. For example, if they have a complex power wheelchair, it's great to put some directions in here for new people to know how to charge or operate the chair and so on. So I wanted to show you now a couple of examples of some pages or information from passports and these are all pulled directly from that good practice manual that I mentioned earlier which is available from the call centre. 
So in this particular example, it's all about how I communicate. And this person uses their face and their eyes to say yes and no. So you can see there's a description there of how they use their face and their eyes, and then uh, an explanation about what those particular things mean. So that's a great way to bring meaning to some of that more um, nonverbal communication. This is an example of an About Me page. And you can see from reading there that it really has a really nice tone to it, presenting positive things about the individual and things that are important to them at the moment. For example, that their house is being fixed up. This is an example of the things you need to know page. So again, this is often occurs right at the beginning of the passport, very important information. Three things you need to know, information about the person's health and the impact of their medication important things about the way you talk to that person that are really important to know and that they often need a bit of time. So you can see that they're quite crucial things if they're right there on one of the first pages of the passport even if that's all that the new communication partner has time to read they're going to be able to read the most important things. This particular page is from a passport where someone is learning to deal with change and sometimes that's difficult for them. So it really gives some nice advice and direction about the visual supports that can be used and the strategies to help that person. So it's best if I'm sitting down and I have lots of space to myself. I can only handle one change at a time. The best time to tell me is just before the change happens and so on. This particular uh, snippet about cuddles says, I love to grab everybody for a big slobbery hug, but I'm learning about other ways to say hello now that I'm a big teenager. I do a good handshake these days, try me. So you can imagine how frustrating it is for families who are trying to perhaps um, teach more socially appropriate ways of greeting rather than hugging strangers when uh, the new communication partner or a new person that they meet does reinforce that hug. So that sort of information is really important that um, we're trying to teach new ways of doing things and shaking hands is, is the new way. So it really gives that information nice and clearly and in a fun and lighthearted way. I'm starting to learn all about the way my body and my feelings are changing. Ask to have a look at my personal and social development file for details about my program. So there might be some private information that needs to be shared and that can be stored separately from the passport, but at least it's linking the relevant people into knowing about that sort of information about those changes that that person's going through. This one down the bottom here is about a person that uses their hands and rubs them together a lot. Um, often people think that they're upset, but they're not. It's just something that they do. So that's really important to provide clarity around some of those behaviours. This page of the passport is about someone that uses their eyes to indicate a lot of their communication. So it provides some really clear information with some good picture support as well. I shut my eyes if I don't want to speak to someone. I look away if I've had enough. I'll look in the direction that I want to go. So you can see that maybe for going into a new school where your education assistant doesn't know you, it might be good that she can refer, he or she can refer back to this as a bit of a guide to be able to really reinforce that good eye contact. In this particular example, it describes a preschooler with a language disorder who often experienced frustration and had tantrums. And they were wondering, well, how are we going to represent that clearly um, and honestly without being too negative. So in this case the individual themselves was involved, the preschooler chose this photo um, to be able to represent how they're feeling and it just puts a, that really nice person-centred spin on the passport and we definitely encourage the individual themselves to be involved as much as possible in the creation of the passport. So like I mentioned on the example of the passport that I pulled up earlier. These are some example type pages that may be included in a passport and they're really just a guide. Certainly more pages can be um, added. When deciding which pages to put in the passport and where to put them, it's important that the most crucial information is available at the start of the passport. So even if someone only has time to read the first few pages, they're going to get the most critical information. It's important regarding the level of detail on each of the pages that we provide just enough information. We don't want it to be like a big lengthy report. It's supposed to be quick and simple to read and process. So just enough information and keep the presentation of the information as simple as possible. 
You might want to consider private pages or pages with pockets. Uh, a private page might have a cover over the top so it only needs to be read by particular people who need that information. Or a pocket page might allow you to um, actually add an object in if that's going to make it meaningful for the individual. It's really important to choose terminology that might suit the individual. So instead of saying, for example, having a tantrum, you might put in like, I threw a wobbler as an example. These are some other example pages. Like I mentioned, you might have specific pages with specific information. The person might have a complex bike, so you might have the instructions for how to use the bike. Or they might really love to um, watch videos, so they might have a page of the different their favourite videos so that their new carer knows exactly which one to put on. You can certainly consider rewording the titles of these example pages for different populations. It's really important to make sure that the passport matches the individual and is age appropriate language is used. So why? Why would you use or create a passport? You create a passport to be able to get to know a person, to have more successful interaction, communication and participation, to support transition into new environments, to make sure and also give families peace of mind that all the important information about their child is being shared with the relevant people the same as with adults, they might be going into a new work setting or into more independent living and it really gives people peace of mind that the right information is being shared. It's good for new unfamiliar or when there's lots of communication partners if you're trying to achieve some consistency in approaches. It's good for planning for the future and it's great for ensuring that that really important information isn't lost when circumstances change. For example, I know many students that have worked with their education assistant for a number of years and yet when they leave school that information is not always passed on to new support workers or new carers or new employers. So it can be a great tool to develop at the end of year 12 or year 13 to be able to ensure that all that information is being carried over. Some of the important things you need to know about the passport is the passport belongs to the individual. I mentioned there's a range of templates available so it doesn't have to be a difficult or onerous task to develop a passport. Special passports can be created as needed and there are examples of those on the website. It's really important to gain permission when creating a passport and there is a number of guidelines around safety and accuracy of information and you can find um, those guidelines on the Passport website which I shared. Most importantly it's good to work as a team and involve all the relevant people to contribute to the passport and the most important person that needs to contribute is the person who the passport is for. The passport owner should be involved as much as possible. Also it needs to be kept up to date and again it doesn't have to be a difficult task but it's important to set review dates to ensure that the information in the passport continues to be relevant. The end product of the passport is normally a small booklet and it's a concise document, but it could also be customised for the individual's needs. It could be wallet sized, it might be a poster on the wall, um, a placemat or a table mat. Videos can be added into more multimedia type presentations. For example, I know one mum that I've worked with who emailed the passport to uh, the local children's hospital prior to their child being admitted um, for some planned um, time in hospital so that that passport could be read by perhaps the doctor or the nursing or therapy staff prior so that they really were able to get to know um, a little bit about her daughter before she went into hospital. A passport as a general guideline shouldn't be any more than 20 pages so that it's just manageable for people to be able to read. And the most important thing is that you use it. So creating the passport is the first part, but really implementing and using the passport in very meaningful ways is the most important thing. So it's important to ensure that the passport's always available and it needs to be used and supported in a range of settings. So you can tell people about the passport. It's recommended to set up routines to ensure that the passport is brought out and shown. For example, new things can be added into the passport and it can be brought out whenever a new visitor comes to the classroom or whenever a new visitor comes to the home. You might set up a reward system whereby the individual gets a point for every time they share their passport with somebody. You can look at having a passport buddy, maybe they've got their own passport too, that they bring out and show. 
You can make the passport interactive by adding notes to pass on to future readers. So really keeping the passport up to date, forming partnerships to ensure that it's used and making sure that you're engaging in discussion between home and school or care staff about how and when the passport will be used. So then the main things that I wanted to share about passports, I just wanted to talk also about some general use of technology for this concept of knowing me, allowing people to introduce themselves and uh, get to know others if they're not able to share and, and get that information across themselves. So even simple things like using a camera or a smartphone, application of tablets and particular apps I'll discuss, even starting to utilise email and social networking tools to be able to assist people to get to know each other. So first, my advice is just to grab a camera. I work with a number of different clients with complex communication needs and I'm always fascinated by the things that they t take photos of and that they want to share. And it's a really um, mainstream thing to do now. Everyone's got their smartphone out or their camera out and will often bring it out at the dinner table and, and share a photo with someone about something that they've been doing. So I really like to encourage the use of photos, whether they be just left on the camera or the phone or the tablet themselves, or printed out and put into, say, an album or even a talking photo album. Just having photos available can be used to initiate a topic of conversation. You can show someone a picture and it, the conversation can just kick off. It's a nice way to be able to share with others to create or to clarify a context. So in the example of Adam that I shared earlier, Adam's able to communicate lots of things, but I just have to be on the same topic first to be able to really understand. So he can point to things in his passport or show me an object or show me a photo to be able to tell me what he's talking about. And once I've got the topic, I'm often able to have much more successful interactions and great chats. So photos really do help to initiate communication on a joint topic. They can encourage interaction and participation, um, allow people to talk about things that they like and that they're interested in, as opposed to sometimes if you're not a big chatter or uh, you do have complex communication needs and it's difficult for you to raise a topic, often you're talking about topics that other people bring up and things that you may not be as interested in. Just having a photo album is really easy to do or even just leaving the photos, like I said, on the gadget and talking photo albums are also available. So just to give you an example, this is a photo of me. I'm at a museum in Canberra and the photo itself provides, you know, a bit of a laugh. Um, and just with sharing that photo with someone, I could kick off a, a, a little conversation and the photo really provides the context. So. Just an idea, a very simple idea to help people communicate more effectively. I wanted to share with you this study. This was an Australian study of vocabulary that children use by Trebath and colleagues. And when I look at this list of words, I'm, I'm not surprised by many of them. But the one word that did stick out to me was Spider-Man. And I thought, why was that such a highly frequently used word with this set of Australian children. And what they were able to describe in the study was that it was around the time that one of the Spider-Man movies had been released. So many of the children in the class were talking about Spider-Man or they had a Spider-Man t-shirts or lunch boxes or whatever it might be. And therefore the word Spider-Man was being used a lot in the classroom. And it made me think about the individuals that I work with, with complex communication needs that might not be able to say, I like Spider-Man. So even just having a, a few photos of Spider-Man or a picture of Spider-Man on their iPod or their iPad or whatever it might be, just having that and being able to share that with a peer is a way for those kids to be able to bring up that topic and be involved in those interactions. And it's not fair if all the other kids are talking about it and yet that person doesn't have the means to be able to join in on those conversations. So that's where just printing off a photo of Spider-Man or having a photo with Spider-Man and sharing that with peers can just be really, really meaningful and allow kids to contribute and have um, that discussion within their social network. This little device here is called a step-by-step -step and it's a product by AbleNet. And essentially it's a simple voice output communication aid. And I really like the use of these in um, collaboration with photos, like I mentioned, or to allow somebody to be able to share their communication passport. So, um, for example, someone might come in to their workplace or to their school and they might have their communication passport in their backpack 
or it might be in the bag on their wheelchair, for example, and they can have the little step-by-step -step in front of them that says, when they hit the button with voice output, in my bag I've got a booklet, it's all about me, please get it out with me and let's have a read. So that's a nice way to be able to introduce and uh, the passport and make sure that it gets used. Down the bottom is a little snippet from the call um, centre manual for passports and it's basically a, a little, um, just a printout that can be stuck on say someone's wheelchair tray. Let's chat. Please get my communication book out of my bag. And it also lists a few things that that person might want to talk about to really have some of that nice interaction. I also wanted to share about the range of different apps that are available um, on the call website. They are bringing out an app for personal communication passports in the future, so we'll be watching out keenly for that. But there are a number of other sort of storytelling apps, for example, Pictello, Book Creator, and the All About Me Storybook that can be used to perhaps bring photos to life or bring somebody's passport to life. So what I can do is just show you a little bit of a video. So this is a, a Pictello video with an About Me story. About me. Hi, my name is Amy. I really love the West Coast Eagles. I go to the games. Do you like football? I go to the beach most weekends when the weather is nice. Pizza is one of my favorite foods, but I hate anchovies. So you can see there. Uh, a simple example of a bit of an all about me book, certainly not a full passport by any means, but just sharing something like that with someone new that you met is a really nice way of someone to be able to introduce themselves and um, get to know them. The last website that I wanted to share was an, it's an online tool um, called MultiMe, which it's just another way, I suppose, to get this knowing me type information out there um, for people to use. So essentially, this multi-me tool is designed to support networking. Um, it's, a, it's a planning tool to help people communicate around the planning that they're doing. It's people telling their story, sharing of information in an online environment. It's a secure environment and the benefit of doing that is even if people aren't in the same place or working for the same organisation, that they can all access the information about the individual. So essentially it's an online profile. There are some costs involved and they differ for individuals and organisations, but there is a free trial available. And I'd like to acknowledge MultiMe website, which was formed by Charlie Levinson. So this is the MultiMe website, a networking tool to help anyone communicate and plan their lives. Um, up here you can access um, a trial or have a look at a demo. And then along the tabs here, you can check out exactly what it is and provides a range of different information about the background and uh, some of the concepts that informed the development of the MultiMe tool. So these are some references from my presentation today. We'll also have um, these slides available as a handout on our website. If you're interested in more information around Knowing Me or on similar topics related to AAC or assistive technology, you might want to follow the Independent Living Centre on Facebook. You can also check out our Pinterest page with a range of different useful links for assistive technology and AAC. And you're welcome to join our mailing list as well through our website. So thank you very much for attending this webinar today. If you have any questions or feedback, you'd be most welcome to email us at technology at ilc.com.au. This is our phone number for people in Western Australia. And it's important if you are interested in making an appointment to come in and have a look at some of the tools that we spoke about today, that appointments are essential. So please do contact us. Thank you very much for your time and attending the webinar today.